Okay, students. Now, till now we have learned uh, Snell's law. Okay, till Snell's law we have learned that is three law of refraction. The last topic uh, that we finished was Snell's law. What is Snell's law? It is defined as the ratio of sine of angle of incidence to the sine of angle of refraction is equal to the ratio of refractive index of the second medium to the refractive index of the first medium. That is sine i by sine r is equal to n2 by n1. Now we shall see that application of Snell's law to the two cases of refraction. Now let us see here. Now case one, light traveling from rarer to denser medium. Usually rarer medium is taken as A, denser medium is taken as water. Okay, that is normal refraction. Now see here, there is xy is the boundary of separation of the interface, n o n dash is the normal. Now see here, this air is there and water is there. Air is the rarer medium and that is n1 refractive index is n1 which is equal to the first medium is rarer medium that's why nr second medium is water which is denser medium that's why n2 is equal to nd n means what refractive index now see here whenever the ray of light is passing from rarer to denser medium you know that the velocity in the rarer medium will always be greater than the velocity in the denser medium how because n is equal to c by v using that relation n and v are inversely proportional so keeping that in mind now you can see here this is the incident light which is traveling in the rarer medium it is incident at the point o along the interface x o y now that ray is undergoing refraction in the water medium that is denser medium where the refracted ray is what it is moving towards the normal that's why reflection angle of reflection decreases angle of incident is more angle of incidence is greater than angle of refraction now it's apply Snell's law now. now from Snell's law sin i by sin r is equal to n2 by n1 n2 is water n1 is air means n2 is denser medium nd n1 is rarer medium nr okay now you know that Angle I means angle of incidence is greater than angle of reflection. That's why sine of angle of incidence is also greater than sine of angle of refraction. If this, if I is greater than R means naturally the sine function associated with those angles will also be greater. That's why if angle I is greater than angle R means sine of angle of I is equal to sine of R. So that is the first case. Now coming to the second case. Now what is the second case? Second case deals with when the light travels from denser to rarer medium, when we come in the reverse way. Now see here, here first medium is water. Water is called as which medium? That is water is called as denser medium. Okay. Now water is which medium? Water is denser medium. Now air is which medium? Air is rarer medium. Now here it was, air was rarer medium and water was denser medium. Now you can see here, the ray of light is coming in the, coming through the denser medium. That's why first medium refractive index N1 is equal to ND. ND means refractive index of denser medium. Now you know that whenever the ray, ray of light Passing from denser to rarer medium, it happens in the reverse process. Here the refracted ray is moving, here the refracted ray, here the refracted ray is moving towards the normal. Refracted ray is moving towards the normal. Here you can see refracted ray is moving away from the normal. When this happens, when the ray of light comes from denser to rarer, Refracted ray moves away from the normal, away from the normal, here it is towards the normal, here it is towards the normal, here it is away from the normal. Now you can see here, angle of refraction is greater than angle of incidence or angle of incidence is less than angle of refraction. Now you can apply the Snell's law, okay. <clears throat> from Snell's law, sin i by sin r is equal to n2 by n1. n2 is which medium here? n2 is rarer medium now. Here n1 is denser medium. Okay. Since angle i is less than angle r, sin i is less than sin r. 
Understood? So, these are the two cases of refraction where we are applying the Snell's law when the ray travels from, in the first case, rarer to denser. In the second case, denser to rarer. Okay? Thank you. Okay, now students, let us move further. We have conditions for no refraction. Means, at what conditions there is not at all any refraction or there is no process of refraction. There are two conditions. One is, when the light is incident normally on the boundary. Okay? So, you have got the idea what, what exactly is when the light is incident normally along the boundary. In reflection also you have studied. Second condition, when the refractive index of the two media are equal. Now let us see the first condition. When the light is incident normally on the boundary. Now see here XOY is the boundary of separation of medium 1 and medium 2. Now this is the normal. Along this normal only you are incidenting incident ray. Now see here AO is the incident ray along the normal. So it is not making any angle of incidence. Right. So that's why you can see here. In the refraction also, it is moving along the normal only. Unlike in reflection, it retraces the same path, right? But in refraction, it will not retrace. But it will move along this normal only in the second medium. That is in medium 2 also, it is moving along the normal. In medium 1 also, the incident ray that is AO is coming along the normal. In the second medium, the refracted ray without making any angle is moving along the normal which means angle of incidence is zero angle of refraction is also zero okay so no refraction occurs means there is no refraction only when the light is incident when the light is incident normally on the boundary on the boundary of two media so when the light is incident normally along the normal on the boundary of the two media what happens? There is no refraction. Okay. Now coming to the second. Which means you cannot obey the Snell's law here. Okay. Snell's law is not obeyed. Now when the refractive index of two media are equal. Now you consider the rarer medium and denser medium. In which there is, if the refractive index are equal. Okay. There are two possibilities. One is you can expect the same medium. Or else different medium with the same refractive index. So what happens? Now see here. Now this is rarer medium and this is denser medium. Here first refractive index of first medium is equal to N. Refractive index of the second medium is also equal to N. Why? Because both the mediums are having the same refractive index. Now see here. X over is the boundary of separation and this line is the normal. With the normal you can see the incident ray AO is making an angle of I. Now, if when the refractive index of the same medium are equal, with whatever angle the incident ray is making in the rarer medium, with the same angle or with the same line, it is moving in the denser medium also, which means there is no refraction. Can you see this ray he is bending towards the normal or away from the normal? No, it is moving along the same line, which means there is no refraction. So, when the two mediums are having the same refractive index, whatever the path that is the incident ray is following, the refracted ray is also following the same path in the denser medium, which means this angle of incidence is equal to angle of refraction, which means you are having the vertically opposite angles here, just like that. Okay, so angle of incidence is equal to angle of refraction. So, no refraction occurs at the boundary that separates two media of equal or same refractive indices. Understood? So, these are the two cases under which we will not find any refraction. Thank you. Okay, students. Now, moving further in the refraction, we shall now consider <coughs> two refractions through rectangular glass slab. Very important. Even you have the activity, we can do this activity. How exactly refraction takes place at the two boundary of separation or at the two interfaces of the rectangular glass slab having sufficient thickness. It should have some thickness. Now, PQRS is the rectangular glass slab. When I say glass, it is having its own refractive index, NG. 
Now outside the glass, on both top and bottom, outside the glass, that is the boundary of the glass, you have which medium? A. Now A is having Na and here is also A, you have Na. Na is the refractive index of A. Now, here two refractions will take place. Where? So, where will be those two refractions? Now, one refraction will take place at the boundary PS. One more refraction will take place at the boundary QR. How exactly it happens? Now, please concentrate on the explanation. Now, you can see here, in A, the incident ray AO is coming and it is incident at the point of incidence O along the normal, sorry, with the normal NO N dash at the first boundary that is PS. Now you can see here it is making an angle of incidence I1 with the normal that is the NO N dash. Now this AO is incident ray when that has to enter to the glass slab it should undergo refraction which means the refracted ray should move towards the normal. You can see here the refracted ray. It is moving towards the normal N O N dash. That angle of refraction is N1. Now which is refracted ray? O B is the refracted ray coming inside. That is coming out of first medium P S and it is uh, happening within the glass slab, inside the glass slab. Okay, that ray is coming out, and that refracted ray OB is means it is bending towards the normal. Now you got the angle of refraction R1. Now again, what is happening here? This refracted ray R1, sorry, this refracted ray OB, okay, is also striking the second opposite side of the glass slab that is opposite boundary you can call QR at the point O again it is striking at the point O okay this OB now this refracted ray from this PS is acting as an incident ray to the second boundary QR see here OB is the refracted ray this refracted ray itself is the incident ray for the second boundary QR. Now see here, that incident ray let me take it as I2. I2 is the angle of incidence at the boundary of second boundary QR and it is making an angle at the normal with the normal M O M dash. Now M O M dash is the normal at the boundary QR. Okay, now when this O B that is refracted ray itself is the incident ray at the boundary QR. Now you see here this is which medium? This is rarer medium. This is denser medium. Again this A is what? Rarer medium. Now when the incident ray falling coming from rarer medium and it is entering denser medium the refracted ray is bending towards the normal. Now the incident ray this incident ray OB is in the denser medium. Now it should come out of this denser medium means it should come from denser to rarer. What happens to the ray of light when it comes to denser to rarer? The angle of refraction or the emergent, okay, that angle of emergence or emergent ray will move away from the normal. See here it is moving away. It is moving away from the normal. Here it is towards the normal. Now this BC is the emergent ray coming out finally out of the rectangular glass slab entering the air medium. See here BC is the emergent ray. BC is emergent ray or this angle of refraction outside QR that angle of refraction R2 is equal to small e. E is called as angle of emergence. R2 is angle of refraction at QR that is outside the second boundary QR but it is also called as angle, angle of emergence. Now you can see here assume that if there was no glass slab okay if there was no glass slab this incident ray would have been in here itself which means it would have travelled straight right see here this dotted line if there was no glass slab the medium would have been the air only. So in that air only, when the light, light ray is incident means it will travel just like a light ray. So it would have travelled, this AO would have travelled like this, this dotted line. Since there is a glass slab, it is undergoing refraction at two uh, boundaries, that is PS and QS, finally it is emerging out. Now see here, this is 
the incident ray without the glass slab the ray is going undeviated undeviated means there is no refraction in the presence of the glass slab oc is the final emergent ray which is coming now what is this shift this shift is called as lateral displacement or lateral shift which means lateral shift lateral shift is the distance or the displacement between the emergent ray between the emergent ray and the angle of it or the incident ray without any deviation i repeat lateral displacement or lateral shift is the distance sorry is the displacement between the emergent ray and the incident ray which is undeviated or which is going undeviated now one more thing you should see here this emergent ray that is oc is the emergent ray is always parallel you can see here these two lines are parallel right it is in parallel to the incident ray ao this incident ray ao is going straight right undeviated for that this should always should always be parallel now we can see that in the analysis now see here you have at the boundary ps now see here at the boundary ps apply snell's law now sin of angle of incidence i1 divided by sin of angle of refraction r1 is equal to second medium that is glass ng divided by first medium that is na that is denser a uh, denser by rarer that is ng by na call it as equation 1 now at the boundary qr here also there is refraction right again apply snell's law there now this angle of incidence here is i2 sin i2 divided by angle of refraction means angle of emergence first i should take it as r2 so sin i2 by sin r2 is equal to now what happens which is the second medium now a is the second medium glass is the first medium see here glass here a so na by ng call this as equation 2 now in equation 2 only you can see here this i2 okay this i2 is equal to r1 why because alternate angles now i will see here see here n o b m n dash o b m you can see here n dash o b is one angle o b m is one more angle see here these two are alternate angles so alternate angles are equal right we can see here okay this is the transversal ob is the transversal in mathematics we have learned right ob is the transversal so whenever there is a transversal you can expect many angles that is alternate angles corresponding angles so that's why we can equate the triangles right that is r1 is equal to i2 i2 is equal to r1 alternate angles also as i told you that r2 is equal to e i'll name this r2 that is angle that is the angle emergent ray oc it is making an angle right with the normal that is r2 that angle of refraction r2 i will name this as small e that is angle of emergence now put these two in equation 2 so sin i2 in place of i2 i will write r1 divided by sin r2 i will write sin e is equal to na by ng now what i do i take reciprocal on both the sides i take reciprocal on both the sides so numerator denominator goes to numerator numerator comes to denominator on both the sides so sin e by sin r1 is equal to ng by na call it as equation 3 now compare 1 and 3 compare 1 and 3 see here one you have ng by na on the rhs in the equation 3 also ng by na on the rhs so when the rhs are equal you can equate lhs therefore sin i1 by sin r1 is equal to sin e by sin r1 sin r1 sin r1 cancels so what you will get sin of i1 is equal to sin of e since sin function is common in both the sides we can equate the angles that is i1 is equal to e very very important what is that mean i1 is equal to e means this emergent ray okay this emergent ray e is always it is always in parallel to the first incident ray at the first boundary ps that is ao ao or 
is parallel to OC. That is the meaning. That's why angle of incidence at the boundary PS, that is I1 is equal to angle of emergence at the boundary QR. So finally that emergent ray, that is E, is equal to the incident ray which was coming at the interface. That is, that is the first interface PS. Understood? And you know, the one more concept in this uh, particular this thing is what? Lateral displacement or lateral shift. Very important. What is lateral shift? Lateral shift is the displacement between the emergent ray and the undeviated incident ray. Okay? So that is the concept. Students, now the same refraction we have seen the two refraction that is happening in the rectangle glass lab. So the next concept is that is the spherical lenses which is very important just like mirrors we have learned concave and convex mirrors. The next is lenses okay spherical lenses this will come in refraction mirrors will come in reflection okay. Now what are spherical lenses as you can see it is also a part of the sphere okay. A spherical lens is a piece of transparent refracting material. It is a piece of transparent because glass is used. So it is a piece of transparent refracting material bounded by two spherical surfaces. It is bounded by two spherical surfaces means two glass spheres it is bounded by. Okay, you will get the lens. So I repeat a spherical lens is a piece of transparent refracting material that is glass bounded by two spherical surfaces. So in these spherical mirror lenses you have two types. One is convex lens, the other one is concave lens. You can see here the symmetry or the shape of the convex lens and you can see the symmetry of the concave lens. Okay. Now convex lens is called as converging lens. Now you can see here in the both the lens you have two spherical surfaces. One is P, one is Q. You can see here, this is P is the spherical surface, then this Q is the one more spherical surface. Okay, you are getting the lens. Similarly, in concave lens also, this P is one spherical surface, Q is one more spherical surface, that's why you have two spherical surfaces. Okay, it is concave lens. Now, convex lens is called converging lens. Why? Because this lens is, uh, it is called as converging lens. Why? Because it is capable of converging all the incident rays which are falling on it. Okay. Now it is called as concave lens is called as diverging lens or divergent lens. Why? Because it is capable of diverging all the rays which is falling on it. Okay. Now, how is the symmetry or uh, this thing, the convex lens? You can see here this lens or how it is uh, made is thick at the center. At the center, you can see it is thick at the center and thin at the edges and thin at the edges at the edges it is very thin whereas at the center it is very thick okay now concave lens you can see this lens is thick at the center sorry thick at the edges at the edges you can see that is pq you can see here at the edges so it is very thick and thin at the center at the center it is very thin so this is convex and concave lens now we have to move to the next that is terms associated with the spherical lens sorry spherical lens what are the terms associated with the spherical lens so you can see here uh, we have taken two lenses that is convex lens the one more is concave lens now uh, the terms associated with this uh, both the lenses are aperture, center of curvature, principal axis and optical center. Now what do you mean by first definition that is aperture. Now in the diagram of convex lens and concave lens you can see here the dotted line at the uh, center that is it is passing a vertical line, a vertical dotted line which is passing through O right from A to B in both the lenses that is called as aperture. So aperture is defined as the diameter of the two spherical surfaces of the lens. Here you have two spherical surfaces P and Q. Here also P and Q. So the diameter that is AB the diameter of the two spherical surfaces 
the diameter of the two spherical surfaces of the lens is called as the aperture. So here AB is the aperture. So second definition is center of curvature. You can see here in the convex lens, since it is having two refracting, sorry, two spherical uh, surfaces, that is P and Q. Obviously, it means it is having two spheres. Two spherical surfaces means two spheres. Obviously, those two spheres should have two center of curvatures. Now you can see here. C1 is the center of curvature for this P. P is spherical surface because this spherical surface is like this. You can see here, this P spherical surface is like this. Okay, so C, uh, this is C1 and this is C2. Now, you can change it, no problem. Now, this C1 is the spherical surface of this P, whereas C2 is the spherical surface of this Q. When these two mirrors are, just assume that when these two spheres are uh, making an intersection, in between you are getting a convex lens. Okay, now you can see here. So, then what are these, uh, what is the center of curvature? Okay, the center of curvature is defined as the centers of two spherical surfaces of the spherical lens. Spherical lens means both concave and convex. I repeat, the center of curvature is defined as the centers of, the center of two, means separate centers, the centers of two spherical surfaces, two spherical surfaces of the spherical lens is called as the center of curvature. Okay, you can see here C1, C2, here also C1, C2. Next comes what? Next comes principal axis. Okay. Now, what is principal axis? Now, principal axis is defined as the imaginary line. Principal axis is defined as the imaginary line which is passing through the center of curvatures of two spherical surfaces of the spherical lens. I repeat, the principal axis is defined as the imaginary lines which is passing through the two center of or the center of curvatures of the two spherical surfaces of spherical lens. Next comes what? So three definitions over, right? Now which are those definitions? Aperture, then center of curvature and principal axis. The last definition is optical center, very important. You can see here the optical center O, right? Here also there is optical center O. Carefully observe. At this optical center, now you can see here these two are the incident rays, okay? And at the optical center you can see here, this incident ray which is coming from this direction to that side or from one medium to another medium, sorry, or from to that side it is going undeviated which means there is no refraction. Similarly, you can see this ray of light which is going in this direction. When it is passing through that optical center O, it is also going undeviated without any refraction. Then what is the definition of the optical center? You can see the same thing in concave lens also. You can see here, the ray of light incident on the optical center goes undeviated. Here also, the ray of light incident on the optical center, it is going undeviated, which means Optical center is the point, optical center is the point on the principal axis, it is point on the principal axis at which, at which the rays of light goes undeviated, I repeat, the optical center, it is the point, usually that optical center means it is along the, it is at, at the point, it, it is, it may not be at exactly at the center of the aperture, no it is not so, it is at point, at some point on the principal axis at which the ray of light should go undeviated, then only that becomes the optical center, okay. So the optical center is a point on the principal axis of the spherical lens at which the rays of light goes undeviated, okay. So these are all the four definitions, you can see here even the concave lens, how it is, how you can see the concave lens in between these two spheres and here also you have two spheres, okay, you are getting the convex lens, thank you. Now students, we shall move on to the, the in detailed description of 
principal focus and focal length of convex lens now we shall uh, study the detailed descriptions of both concave and convex lens in that first it is convex lens now you know that the convex lens is having two spherical surfaces right that is in the the diagram that we have studied it is having p and q so from one side you are getting the there should has to be an object to the other side there has to be an image which means there are two spherical surfaces so since there are two spherical surfaces whatever the terms that we used to have in the mirrors okay that is uh, only one focal length and only uh, one principal focus for mirror why because it is having only single spherical surface now it is having two spherical surfaces that's why you are having two focal length you are having then two principal focus like that okay now this convex lens is having two spherical surfaces that's why it you are having two principal principal foci foci is the plural of focus okay principal focus since you have two principal focus so here i have used two principal foci which means if you have two principal foci means means two principal focus means obviously you should have two focal points so you have two focal points that's why convex lens is having two spherical surfaces which means two principal foci and two focal points now carefully observe here this is the convex lens okay both are convex lens now to the left side always to the left side you have f1 f1 is called first principal focus first principal focus f1 is always on the left side of the convex lens now see this convex lens here now to this convex lens see to the right side you have f2 f2 is called second principal focus it is always towards the right side of the convex lens now when you have the first principal focus to the left side of the convex lens obviously from the optical center o to the first principal focus f1 it is the first focal length obviously you will have first focal length similarly from the optical center o to the second principal focus you are having second focal length okay now what is the definition for first principal focus first principal focus is the position of the object you can see here now see here at first principal focus the object is at first principal focus from the object the light is coming out and it is striking or it is coming in the interface that is along at the aperture at the aperture of this convex lens the incident rays are falling now these incident rays are getting refracted now you can see here there is bend in the path of the light why because convex lenses support refraction right or uh, that's why you can see the refraction all these refracted rays are moving parallel now this is the center line is the principal axis okay now these two are in parallel now when the object is at first principal focus the image will be formed at infinity remember okay the image will always be formed at infinity when the object is at first principal focus the image is at infinity so that's why the definition first principal focus f1 is a position of the position of the point object at that point on the principal axis at that point means what this principal focus first principal focus itself this point is lying on the principal axis for which the the image is formed at infinity for which the image is formed at infinity is the definition of first principal focus f1 i repeat first principal focus f1 is defined as the point on the principal axis at which the object is placed to this object to the other side that is to the right side the image is formed at infinity then only it is called as the first principal focus means compulsorily if the object is at first principal focus to the right side image should be at infinity okay next 
Now, what is first focal length F1? Very simple. First focal length F1 is the distance between first principal focus and the optical center. I repeat, first focal length F1 is the distance between first principal focus and the optical center of the convex lens. Next, second principal focus. When will second principal focus will come? Now, we have studied this principal focus for one surface, one spherical surface. Now, there is one more spherical surface, right? To that sur spherical surface also, we should study. Means, we will get the same thing. Now, second principal focus F2. Now, we can see here, second principal focus F2 is the reverse uh, definitions. Now, see here. The object when it is coming from infinity, when the object is coming from infinity, when it is falling on the aperture or the aperture of the convex lens, you can see here, these are, or when it is falling on the convex lens, it is getting refracted. Not only it is getting refracted, it is getting converged. It is getting converged, refracted and converged at second principal focus. At this second principal focus, you are expecting the image. Which means, whenever the object is coming from infinity, the image is formed at second principal focus. Okay. Now, what is that second principal focus definition? The position of the object on the principal axis. The position of the object on the principal axis means object is coming from infinity. Okay. The position of object on the principal axis Sorry, the position of the image. Second principal focus means you should concentrate on image. Second principal focus is the position of the image on the principal axis for which the object is placed at the infinity or object is situated at the infinity. I repeat, second principal focus is defined as the position of the point on the, uh, the point of image on the principal axis for which the position of the object is at infinity or object is situated at infinity. Now, you know, we have understood the definition of second principal focus. Now, from this second principal focus to the optical center, whatever the distance that you are getting is the second focal length. Okay, second focal length F2 is the distance between second principal focus and the optics optical center so what do you have understood here now for the one of the spherical surface you are getting first optical focus okay that is first principal focus and first focal length towards left side right now here you are having second principal focus and second focal length towards right side so here the object is at the first principal focus, you are expecting the image at infinity. But here, the image is at second principal focus and the object is situated at infinity. So, very important, the principal focus and focal length of convex lens. That's why you have, since the convex lens has two surfaces, you are having two principal focus or two principal foci and two focal points. Which are the two focal points? F1 and F2. Which are the two principal uh, focus? Uh, principal focus? That is F1 and that is capital F1 and capital F2. Optical center remains the same. That is O is the optical center. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, students. Uh, after finishing uh, the principal focus and focal length of the convex lens, let us move on to principal focus and focal length of a concave lens. Now you can see here, this is the diagram of the concave lens. Now the center line which is passing in both the diagrams is the principal axis. Okay. Now, here you can see here, I will explain the first diagram. You can see, the center line is the aperture and here you have the optic center O. Along this optic center, you are having the principal axis. Now, the light rays which are falling on this one of the spherical surface and it is at moving to the interface that is on the aperture when it is moving on the aperture you know that it will get 
refracted. It will get refracted. Now you can see here this is the incident ray and this is also incident ray above and below the principal axis. Now at these two points it is getting refracted. Now see here the refracted rays are going in parallel. Okay. The refracted rays are parallel to the principal axis. Now since this is incident rays in order to get the first principal focus in order to have the first principal focus you have to virtually extend these two incoming rays or incident rays on the principal axis see the dotted lines virtually you are extended so that they both converges they both converges at one point which is called as F1 they are getting converged at this point called as F1 now this F1 is the virtual point, right? This is the virtual point. Now, for this virtual point, the refracted rays are going, you can see here at this interface, the refracted rays are going parallel, which means when the refracted rays are going parallel means the image is formed at infinity. Now you can see the image is formed at infinity for because the parallel rays are moving, the refracted rays are moving in parallel. Now, if you are converging these two incident rays virtually, you are getting the first principal focus F1. At this point, the object is situated. So, F1 is the virtual point on the principal axis at which the object is situated. For this object, the image is formed at infinity. Why? Because the refracted rays, the refracted rays are moving in parallel to each other or in parallel to the principal axis. Okay. Now, this F1 is called as first principal focus. Now, the distance between the optical center and the first principal focus is called as the first focal length. Now, what is the speciality when you compare this to the convex lens. Now you can see here the first principal focus and the first focal length is formed on the right side. Right? On towards the right side of the aperture or right side of the optical center. Whereas in convex lens it was formed towards the that is F1 and this small F1 was towards the left side of the aperture or left side of the optical center. Right? So here it is towards the right side. Now coming to this second now, because concave lens is also having two surfaces, one surface we have finished, that's why we got first principal focus and first focal length. For the other surface you have to find out second principal focus and second focal length. Now we can see here, the ray of light is coming parallel to the principal axis from far distance. Okay, now it is falling on the interface, that is on the aperture, so that the refracted rays, you can see these, these two refracted rays are diverged. They are diverged. These two are the divergent rays or the refracted rays which are going divergent. Now, how to obtain the second principal focus? Now, these two divergent rays, you just extend backwards, that is extend virtually, okay, extend virtually backwards so that those two divergent rays, that is those two refracted rays virtually, they converge at one point on the principal axis, what we call it as second principal focus. Now, the initially when these incident rays were coming in parallel to the principal axis, is those rays were coming from the object which was at infinity. These two parallel rays were coming from the object which was at infinity. Now at this point on the aperture or on the interface of the lens, they are getting refracted, which means they are getting diverged, divergent rays. When you are extending those two divergent rays virtually using the dotted lines backwards or sidewards, it is meeting at some point on the principal axis at F2. That F2 is called as what? Second principal focus. At that second principal focus, an image is formed. So in this case, the object is coming, the object is situated at infinity and the image is formed at second principal focus. 
Now, the distance between the second principal focus and the optical center is called as the second focal length. Now, you can see here the second principal focus and the second focal length is towards left side of the optical center or to the left side of the lens or towards the left side of the aperture. Understood? Now this is the first focal length and the sorry the first focal length and the first principal focus is towards right side. The second uh, uh, principal focus and the second focal length is towards left side. Very very important. Now let us go to the definitions. Okay? You know that the convex lens is having two spherical surfaces, which means two principal focus. Okay? Two principal focus and two focal points or two focal length. Now what is first principal focus? First principal focus is the virtual position. Why? Because you can see here behind the mirror. Okay. It is the virtual position of the object. Virtual position of the object on the principal axis for which the image is formed at infinity. Infinity in the that is the convex lens. Next first focal length. First focal length is the distance between first principal focus and the optical center. That is the distance between F1 and O. Next second principal focus F2. Second principal focus F2 is also the virtual position of the image. It is the virtual position of the image on the principal axis for which the object is situated at infinity. Now what is second focal length F2? Second focal length F2 is the distance between the second principal focus and the optical center. Okay. Now very very important you can see it down I have written note. When you are writing the ray diagram for convex lens, first mark the optical center O. Then take equal distance. If you are taking 2 cm, take 2 cm towards the left of the optical center mark F1, first principal focus. Without changing the 2 cm, take the same distance, measure 2 times F1. 2 times F1 means 2 twos are 4 cm at 2 F1. Now, this first principal, uh, first focal length is the distance between O and F1. Second, uh, second focal length is the distance between O and F2, 2F1. Similar towards the right side. Mark second principal focus F2 at same 2 cm. Then 2F2 you will get a 2 twos are 4 cm. Take 4 cm measurement. Similarly you will get small F2 and small 2F2. Which means F, small F2 is at 0 and F2, that is O and F2, that is the second focal length. Then you will get, okay, 2 times F2. Like that, this is for convex lens. Next for concave lens, you can see here, okay, as per these two conventions you have to write, okay. Now towards the right side, you will get first principal focus and with the same uh, distance, without changing the measurement, equal measurement, you will get 2 times F1. So F1 series will come towards the right side. Now F2 series, that is second principal focus, will come at the same distance, that is 2 cm. Now 2 times F2 means 2 twos are 4 cm. It will come from optical center, you have to take 4 cm. At the corresponding uh, what, uh, directions only, you are getting the first focal length and second focal length. So while writing the ray diagram, you have to keep this in mind. Thank you.